You've got a pen, right? Because we're going to take notes. This is a working workshop. Does everybody have, if you don't have a booklet uh, or a pen, Braden and Blake again, just wave and they can bring it over to you. So I think we all agree we want the money. That's a pretty big motivator. And the other part of this is, why are you listening to me? Why am I qualified? So I have three engineering degrees. I have zero loans ever that I took out and I never got a, received a dime from the Cherokee Nation. I paid for all three degrees, including my PhD, with scholarship dollars. And both my parents are teachers in the state of Oklahoma, which meant we were above poverty line, but not enough to help two students through school. So I was not Pell eligible. I lived outside the Cherokee Nation, and I had no student loans, and I paid for all those degrees with scholarship dollars. So I'm sharing how I did that with you, every trick that I learned. That's what this is about. And this has been developing for more than 20 years, this workshop packet. So communication in the age of social media, and I'm gonna to try to allow time for questions. So we are going to push through what's normally a three hour workshop in less time, okay? So your first one should be the communication, is that right, in the age of social media? So overall, what I would suggest to you is when you're talking to your student, and there's some folks, this is not, this is their second or third time at my workshop, uh, which is awesome, thank you. I mean, because we take this really serious, this is like a process. So when you sit down to talk to your student or your young person, and some of them, you're gonna realize I'm serious about the fourth grade. It can, this discussion cannot start early enough. Then you, then you have to ask them, what is it that they want to do? Because if they wanna be president of the United States or governor of the state of Oklahoma, they cannot do certain things on social media over time because we all know those things get tracked, right? So I think it deserves a broader discussion about what do you want to do, therefore what do you want to portray, and who do you want to be? So I know that the, the younger folks today are growing up in a time where selfies are very much ingrained and the expectations about what is shared is much different than maybe even when I grew up, right? So we need to have a very upfront discussion that these things never go away. Those pictures or those posts, and to some degree, even likes. Does everybody realize that there were folks that lost their position at Harvard as students because they liked something that had been sent to them or reposted it? Yes, so this is very serious. You will even hear about Division I athletes that lose their scholarships because of what they've tweeted or what they've posted on Facebook or Instagram. You're not going to hear about the rocket scientist. Your employer, over time, will look at what you've posted. And I venture to say that at some point they may really, really have to dig through our social media some time back, and we just haven't seen that yet. So the time is now to start setting parameters and kind of rules of engagement around social media because you can lose scholarships and you're not going to hear about losing those scholarships, right? If they're the next engineer on the block. So Brett and, Dr. Brett and I both happen to be engineers um, and I'm thankful social media did not exist for us at that point in time, right? That's a good thing. So it involves a lot of things including phone etiquette, so let's start there. How many of your students can actually pick up the phone and have a verbal conversation that's professional? So when they answer the phone, and you're gonna have to test them over time, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to check in. This is, it's like an exercise. You're, you gotta exercise your muscles. You have to flex them and start building your muscles over time because it's practice. When MIT or Harvard calls your student, for the full ride scholarship and you didn't practice with them over time and they go hey in the phone we're not getting the full ride scholarship right to the dream school 
This, so every one of these details, this is what this is about. So when they answer the phone, do they say, hello, this is Kara Callen Watts speaking, or this is Kara speaking? Is there a professional response when they answer? If you call them, or if they're calling out, how do they, how do they call out to folks? Are they, are they, hello, this is Kara Callen Watts, I am calling so-and-so to do this, right? Can they, can they actually verbalize on the phone? Because I have feedback that people can't handle physical verbal interviews anymore at this point because of the use of social media. So there are large, large scholarships and really nice colleges that people want to get into. And we start flexing our muscles early on the skill sets it takes to get there. When they leave a message, how do they leave a message? When I was on tribal council for 12 years, this is one of my favorite messages. Hi, this is Karen Cowan Watson. I've got a phone number and I mean, my phone number phone and five from there. Thanks. I'm like, who am I calling and how do I call them back? I can't listen to that five times and still get the phone number. And I live in rural Oklahoma, so it may not show up on caller ID, right? So when they call, is it, hi, this is Kara Cowan Watts. I'm calling for Beverly Cowan. Please return my call at your earliest convenience. And then 918-752-4342. Again, my number is 918-752-4342. 4342. You're gonna call that person back, right? Amazon now calls that friction. There's actually, on marketing and sales, Amazon has identified that they can increase their sales and response from customers by decreasing the friction in buying things online and making sure batteries come, because when we're open this at midnight for, this, for us or a, a child or whatever's going on, and we don't have batteries and we live in rural Oklahoma, they, they're immediately gonna probably be returned to Amazon. Well, how do you think those people are gonna do? They wanna give you money and so if you're not making it easy to call you back as an applicant, applicant, do you think that they're gonna give you the money, the friction? You wanna make that as easy as possible in your process for them to engage you and return phone calls, right? So every little step adds up because you want the money in the palm of your hands. You do not want student loans. So here's another way to think about it. Is it anybody go to the Clemmer Indian Hospital? Okay, so that's IHS, it's rugged. God love them, right? That's a lot of people going through there. Imagine, is anybody in the medical industry? Do we have any doctors or nurses and such? So, you know, there's always that tug and pull between doctors and nurses. So imagine that you have a group of nurses, and we're gonna make our front table the nurses. And they're like, cussing the doctors, we don't have enough of us, they're arrogant, they get all the, the glory, but we're doing all the work. So they decide at their lunchtime, and, and Claremore's a 24-7 shift, that they're gonna put money in a hat and start a scholarship for people at RSU to get a nursing degree. There's a four-year nursing degree at RSU. So they're gonna put together, and they may pull together like 200 bucks. This could buy a book for somebody that would otherwise like quit school. Okay, but they have no idea what they're doing. They've never done a scholarship before. They write up some form that makes no sense whatsoever, and, but they have good intentions, okay? They're already overworked. They all have like three to six kids at home. Some of them are single parents. We got all sorts of drama, plus whatever's going on at Claremore. So we'll pick Andrew. Andrew becomes the point of contact. This happens with a lot of scholarships. I'm giving you this example because this is real reality. Even bigger nonprofits with staff, this is kind of descriptive of what goes through their head, okay? So you start not following instructions, you start calling him, not leaving him proper, Andrew proper phone numbers and things like that. Do you think you're gonna get that $200 that you really need? Or do you think that those volunteers that gave all that money are just gonna put you on the no pot? See, that's really how it works. So you have to be very detailed in this process. So again, make sure you leave messages, do not leave emails. How many of you actually email people off the email they leave you on a phone message? That's major friction. You're just not gonna be able to type that down. 
So I put on there, don't leave emails, websites, or multiple phone numbers. They're never gonna remember it. How many of you are driving down the road and you have to pull over just to write the one down that you remember? So again, we're talking about friction. You wanna make it easy for people to give you their money. That's what it's about. You want it easy to give you the money. Recorded messages. So when somebody calls your student and they get their message, is it boom chicky boom boom music or rap music or country music or crazy music or is it a professional message? Hi, this is Kara Callan Watts. Please leave your name, number, and a brief message of tone. Because again, if you're wanting into Harvard or MIT or wherever that is, or you want OSU's full ride or OU's, whatever that looks like, you're wanting the money. And at this point, we obviously have a lot of folks out there that have issues and everyone's trying to find calm people that don't appear to have issues to surround themselves with and fund, right? There's a lot of that going on. Okay, so phone etiquette is still critical in the age of social media. Google and practice, and you need to practice, and this is where the team comes in because again, parents cannot do this work for the student. This ha you are, I'm teaching you to be the coach for your student. So the actual skill set is behavioral interviewing. So I've got that in quotes. You can highlight it on there. It's also referred to as STAR. Situation or task, action, result, or outcome. So um, my beautiful sister-in-law is a human resources exec for a worldwide company that is often on people's tongues. We talk about this. Behavioral interviewing is still a technique that we are trained to do, right? That is still something they train individuals in these companies to do. And if you learn how to do it, even if you have somebody that doesn't do behavioral interviewing and they're a poor interviewer, you can take control of that interview and own it. I've done it before. Because Sheila Packard, when I was a professional, trained me to do behavioral interviewing for college students. So this is a tool set. There's a lot of examples, practice it. I know this sounds goofy, but this will pay off dividends when they're talking about negotiating their first salary, uh, getting the promotion they want. This is life skills that will pay not only in the scholarship process, but later. Texting. It really is not a communication tool for scholarships. And, and um, I don't know, is there a way, Amy, that we can post this on the on the page or something as a PDF? Yes. Okay, so we'll, they'll get posted to Jinx if, you, if you're having trouble. I know not everybody uh, can read smaller print, so if you have trouble reading it, I think they need to really look, you need to look at texting habits. Unless that committee, again, of nurses has said, please text me, do not do it. Unless you have been given permission, that's not how you conduct business via texting. And there's a bunch of rules I wrote out. Email. How many of you have had a typing course ever? My mother made me do this and I hated her for it at the time. I'm just gonna own that, right? It was a night class. And I was like, what am I doing in here? It's the best thing ever. Now I get these emails that make no sense. There's no structure. They have no business correspondence. There's, they're not addressing anyone. They don't have complete sentences. They don't have sentence structure. They don't have paragraphs. It's very difficult to read, right? So if you can, you need to treat email just as you would written correspondence and get out one of those old business typing books and show them what a business letter looks like because they will just leaps and bounds glow above other applicants if they can just do a brief email that is structured properly, it's kind of like in a business letter. It doesn't have to have the full heading up top that we were always taught with like the name and the address and those kind of things, but it should still have the salutation, the body, and then at the bottom, you want the signature. So that's the number four. This is something new, particular for email. I believe in signatures at the bottom. We'll go back to the nurses. You're a committee, you do it by email. Let's say you submit the application by email and it was an attachment and you circulate the attachment. How many of you have been at work and after you got forwarded the email chain and you're the one that has to end up doing the work, there's no attachment. You can't find what the original email is about. 
you can't even, for some reason, the header of the email has the name, but not the email of the person, and they didn't sign it with their contact information at the bottom. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? That happens all the time. Friction. If you create a signature that says your name, your mailing address, your email, and your phone number, who's going to get the money because you made it easy to find you, right? And it doesn't just happen with this volunteer group. It happens in somewhat bigger organizations that are nonprofits that look pretty formal, and even especially then larger organizations. Social media. I do not care for MySpace personally. I guess it has been rebooted and it's no longer creepy. <laughs> but it kind of used to look like stalker kind of stuff. It was weird. I haven't looked at it in a while. I guess musicians are really using it now, so maybe it's okay. Uh, but again, I'm pretty focused on STEM, kind of really nerdy professional careers, right? So I'm, I'm biased that way. I own that up front. So I would focus on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Of course, Google tools are important. By the way, on email, uh, I would not advocate anyone using AOL and Yahoo. And the reason why, and some of the others, how many of you have been hacked or let somebody, have somebody else in your address book has been hacked on those servers and you get these crazy emails? SBC Global even, right? Gmail rarely gets hacked. I, I do not work for Google, I do not benefit from them, but their stuff's free, it looks professional, there's other kinds that are like Gmail, but I would go ahead and have a professional email. For example, I did not talk about it here and I should have. How many of you have, okay, so my Gmail is karacallenwatts at gmail.com, all lower letters. Friction, that's easy to, easy to type, right? I'm not having to think about it as much. It's my name. It's very identifiable, clean, professional. We still, okay, when I used to do this on tribal council and Cherokee Nation businesses would come and they were recruiters sitting there, they would roll over laughing every time. And I'd have different people. And I know Creek Nation, because Cher's back in the room. They, they have this too. We would get hot mama 69 at hotmail.com. People would apply with emails like this. You cannot make this up. I mean, they would roll all out of their chairs because they're like, it, it's still just weird, wacko emails. Or I have a friend that works for the CDC. His email is not his name. I cannot remember his email for the life of me, right? It, it doesn't start with any, it doesn't have anything to do with his name. It's like a couple of letters, a couple of numbers. Friction. It is not allowing me to communicate with him easily, right? So you want a email that's not going to hack and spam people. It's going to create problems. You don't want to be lost in Spain on Seville, right? Or whatever they say, and I'm on a trip and I need help because I've been kidnapped. You know, whatever those things are. So you want a professional looking one for your stuff. And then make sure your Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter also look professional. If you're going for the big money, for the big schools, whatever that is, that's what that looks like. If you are artistic, then make it something that's appropriate for artists, not to alienate our artists. But, you know, and there's nothing that a nice, clean headshot, it doesn't have to be professional, just looks somewhat professional, does in that profile. How many of you get freaked out when you get those friend requests from people that don't even bother to put a picture on it? That's unacceptable too, right? So you can't have in incomplete social media profiles. So the other thing that I talk about with HR professionals and other hiring managers or leaders of companies, I talk about and ask them, well, what do you do if people don't have accounts? That's kind of weird too. So if you're like one of those anti-Facebook people or anti-Twitter, you know, but I would say you have to have LinkedIn. That's part of your professional experience, right? You have to have LinkedIn. But I would, and you, I don't think Twitter's necessarily required, but on your Facebook, I would get something very professional and friendly and leave it at that and make it private. But it just looks happy and fun and professional. Does that make sense? And kind of tells who you are. So they know that you're not like sitting at home with no friends. There's that whole idea now out in the world that we have to be connected. 
So that is a very real issue. You, so if you distance yourself from social media, you kind of need to create a presence at the same time. There's a balance, right? Uh, pictures, like even Pinterest, your articles, your research. If, you're, if you already know that you're a supreme nerd and you are excited about something very, very particular, I don't know, like, like what if there was underwater basket weaving, right? So if there was underwater basket weaving, how do you become an expert in that? Well, every article you post on your profile should be about underwater basket weaving then, right? Become a subject matter expert. So if the scholarship people, the nurses, or whatever that is, or if it's about nursing and you want to go into pediatric nursing or something like that, you need to connect. And when they look at your profile, they're like, boy, they're already researching articles. They're interested in this topic. They're supporting groups like this for the foundation. That's how you use your social media. But be care again, on the Harvard example, be careful about your status, comments, privacy. Don't forget we're going from a smaller community typically to a larger community, so you need to talk about security settings with your students and what's visible to public or not. Because we're gonna go from, everybody can know what they're doing in these gated neighborhoods, so they're going to college at some point. So you need to make sure you understand security settings. And also sometimes, like I think in the Harvard example, Kimberly, wasn't it the, the friends, the group of friends Actually, I don't know that everybody actually participated in, the, it was a major discrimination issue. I don't know that actually everybody actually participated, but they all got booted, right? Because they were in that circle. So you need to be cautious about what your friends are posting, what shows up on your wall, your feed, right? So control that. Thank you notes. How many of you actually send written thank you notes? Handwritten thank you notes. Oh yes, I love you. Okay, when's the last time? So there was, oh, this is great. So for like less than a dollar, you can change your world. Really, I mean that's really, so by the time you do a 25 cent, you, those nice ones from Walmart or CVS, they're like white with, with the silver or gold or whatever and they just say thank you really pretty and a script across them. Those are great and you just handwrite. it doesn't have to be but one to three sentences. Right? It doesn't have to be like elaborate. And then you've got a 50 cent stamp, so it's less than a buck. So let's say the nurses don't pick you and they pick your best friend, but he decides not to go to RSU for nursing, which is where that scholarship's tied to. But you appreciate it because Andrew had answered all your questions or something had happened or just that the committee had took time to review your deal and you sent them a thank you note. You may have been fifth on their list, but who do you think is going to get the money when your friend declines the scholarship because they're not going to go to RSU? Andrew's going to be like, Kara's getting the money because she was the only one that sent a thank you note and even cared that I answered the phone and talked to him, right? You can bump yourself into other opportunities even later. I have literally had people hand me opportunities because of consideration such as a thank you note, thanks mom for teaching me that, that later I would, we're talking major amounts of money, like $5,000 and stuff. This is serious money. So thank you notes. And if you're not, and so I think I put a little bit of guidance on there. You know, make sure you address them. People love hearing their name. So, you know, like if you were going to write me a thank you note about tonight, you'd say, Kara, you know, salutation, comma, you know, whatever it is. Thank you so much for taking time to come to Jinx and present your scholarship workshop. I really appreciate it, and I'll put it all to, hard, all to work. And then you sign your name. That's it. That's exciting. And make sure there's a return address on there so I can find you if I wanted to follow up with you. Or, yeah, I can't read your writing, so I need to know what your name is, right? So you make sure it's clear. That starts creating your network. That starts delivering money. Even if it's not right at that moment, you will translate that into dollars later. Okay. Really quick, the next page. Do you see the poorly written email example that I kind of made up in the Google? Is that on there? So can anyone tell me why all caps is a bad thing? It is shouting. Was that, was that going to be your response, shouting back there? 
Yeah, it, and it, uh, that is correct. You're both correct. Okay, for some of the younger folks or folks that have never been taught this, it really is. I've gotten e emails when I was on tribal council especially. They were all in caps, whole paragraphs. I could not read it. It was blinding. It was like I was being shouted at because that's what it does. So do not use all caps. Make sure to, you know, that's, that's not an email right there. So the, the next page is more of an example of something with structure. So it's more like you would see in the old fashioned typing books, you have a salutation, a body, and you, then you sign off. And there is an actual signature that I created that may be a bit lengthy, but there's an example of what to do to make sure people can find you later if the attachment or whatever gets lost, right? Okay. And that phone number no longer works, by the way. That's my old tribal council number. So don't, don't call that. I don't know why that lady has not changed her number. I feel bad for her. So, okay. Recommendation letters. That's the next section. So do you, th this is part of your inventory. So everything I'm talking about should be triggering notes and action items. Stuff to follow up on. Either you have it, don't have it, need to have it, know where to go next. You're starting to pull out what you need to do, your to-do list to get ready for the application process, right? Some of these are long-term things you build over time. Some of these we gotta do catch up if it's your senior year and it's the first time I've seen you at this presentation. Um, or, you know, something else. So we've gotta figure this out together. So when you request a letter, do you actually know the person? I would actually, I'm not a very good politician. I would actually turn down people I did not know for a recommendation letter. You know why? because it wouldn't have made a good one. If you need to actually, so this is your inventory. Go through and figure out with your student who needs to be the recommendation folks that you use. They cannot be related and they should have work experience with your student, either at the school or outside the school in a volunteer or paid capacity. You think that's right, Kimberly? Yeah. Okay, so you start this inventory list and you know that they have to know your student enough to actually tell a story. So let me give you an example. When I started on tribal council, we went and rebuilt uh, a roof. We re-roofed and we had to actually do all sorts of tear off on an Indian church in Claremore with a group of folks. And I was pretty new to the community. I was in my twenties. And so we got up there, all sorts of people got up on that roof. It was exciting. We spent like three or four weekends roofing together. Has anybody ever roofed? I mean, that's hard work, okay? So by the time we were done, those people got awesome reference letters from me. We knew about each other. I knew about their work ethic. Here they're volunteering their time for these elders at this Indian church that could never get up on that roof, right? And they were cooking for us and they'd help with the tear off on the bottom because they could be down. So this was an experience. I would write recommendation letters for those folks and I would talk about being at that Indian church re-roofing with them and how they showed up on time they made their commitment as a volunteer and this is what they did they had work ethic so you want those kind of experiences somehow with your students in your inventory that you've started making a list and then you need to be honest with yourself will that person do a great letter for you so Maybe they don't have the best uh, English or writing skills, right? But maybe they're gonna be an incredible asset for you because they really know your student. They've gotten to know them somehow. So you may have, this is the one case where I would say that you may want to help write a letter with a person in order to help your student if they don't. But you need to be honest. Do not pick someone that's going to hurry a letter for your student or write a poor letter and just get it out the door and it basically says nothing. We want a great letter because again, we're here for the money. We want the money in the palm of your hands. We do not want student loans. We do not want you having to work minimum wage jobs when you should be focused on being a student and going to school and finishing. So that's the goal. So to do that, you need great letters. You need a great list, great letters, then when you, when you go, are you providing all the information? My favorite is I would get a text message randomly from someone asking for a recommendation letter. 
That's it. Good okay. luck. So let's skip down from number three. We're going to go to provide the following up front. So you need to know the full name of the scholarship because again, if you can't name the nurse's scholarship and you're asking for their money and you can't name it correctly, whatever they've named it, are you going to get their money? No, they're going to turn you down. This, they're, they're volunteering to give out their own money. Make sure you, you put in an email to your, have this ready because whoever does it is going to have to have all the same information. The full name of the scholarship or the job, whatever it is, the name and address that the letter of recommendation is going to, and sometimes the number three is that you mail it somewhere different than what it's addressed to. That happens. So you need to be very, this is not the job of the person that's going to write the letter to get this information. This is your job to gather this up. So I'm trying to make it, here's your checklist, right? I'm trying to make it as easy as possible. Then you want to make sure and give them a website so they can learn more about the scholarship if they have questions and they're doing it at midnight and they can't call you. That happens. I've had that happen. I've done that. So go ahead and lay out the website. Then you want the basic core brief information. So don't expect them to dig through the website though to find the one page about the one scholarship that the big organization offers. So you need to, to hone down what's important that they might highlight in the letter about the scholarship that you're asking for or the entry. Like if they're writing the reference to, to Harvard or Dartmouth or MIT, you need to say, what is that that's important that you want in that letter that's, that needs to be like keywords the committee reads. You may go ahead and draft a letter for them. You don't want them to necessarily sign that, but how many of you get these requests and you have writer's block? So a draft letter friction expedites the request because you're gonna take that and make that your own. Share how many, how many requests for letters do you get? I mean, it's crazy. So if you get that draft letter, Boy, it makes it so much easier. It, they'll make it their own, and you've given them time and energy to make a great letter then, right? Then make sure it included in one email. Do not flood my inbox with 10 different emails for one request, right? Do we know what we're talking about here? So we learn how to make those packages that are in one place. Oh, and at the top, it needs to be the due date that you have to have it back from them to put it in the package. Because we're all busy adults with these massive jobs and families coordinating and all this other stuff. So the important thing then becomes they need to decide, do they have time right now to make your due date? And, it, and if you put that at the top, they'll tell you very quickly, yes or no. Then you can move on to the next person on your list if it's no. Remember, friction. We're trying to eliminate friction get the money. So going back up, are you being respectful in your request? And when I say this, how you were, how did you request it and how long did you provide it? Did you just randomly walk up, not have all the information or text some weird message to them? Or did you give them a proper email, follow up with a phone call at least two weeks prior to when it's due and kindly ask them for some time to do this and follow up with your thank you note? Do you see how this works? I mean, this will pay dividends, I promise, throughout the whole process. So, and that number five talks about that. Number six, we already talked about. Okay, number seven. If you use someone as a reference, you have to have their permission. I know this seems obvious probably to about half the room, but the other half's like just randomly putting people on your list, I promise. So, when you go through, you need to make sure that you have their permission. And you can't ask Kara Callum Watts two years ago, do I have your permission to use you as a reference and then never talk to me again and suddenly OSBI shows up for a background check <laughs> for you, right? Or something else. Well, Dylan's having a good time. <laughs> you guys, good night. Thanks for helping too. Okay, so then we've got and what is enough when considering knowing your recommender. So we're kind of going back up to the first part. So this one through six gives you a, a detailed list about what, what is actually, when you're doing your inventory, what you need to do. What, how are you evaluating these people you put on your list? And then, then what makes a great letter, I detail one through seven. 
So the, the one thing that I didn't talk about is your, actually the details on the list. Okay, if you come ask Kara Cowan Watts for a reference letter and I say yes, or recommendation list that, that I would provide recommendations, do you also ask what address they prefer, <coughs> what email they prefer? Some of us can, re can receive emails all day long at work and others cannot. So you would need a private email versus a work email or, or things like that, right? What phone number would they even answer for your reference? And that's part of your inventory. So you need to start taking all those details and you create a sheet. You might as well put it in a Word document. I use Google Keep because it's dynamic. I can access it at all times and I don't have to worry about saved versions. So it, you can just put it in there and you can always copy it over to a, a document or something. So you need to know what your list of priorities and sometimes you may have, if you're really net, networked and connected, you're gonna have professional network because you were in paid positions. You're gonna have your uh, volunteer network. You're gonna have a church network. You may have three and four really solid references under multiple different categories. Um, sometimes, these scholarships are focused on the Indian connection, so you may need your tribal references, and then other times you may not need tribal references, it has to be something else, so that may be its own section as well. And again, that's why it's important you have to know who your council person is, because again, you're not going to get a great letter even if they're willing to give it to you, just because you show up and say, hey, <laughs> yeah, I haven't met you, but I need a reference letter. That doesn't work very well. I mean, people will try to do their best, but it's not a glowing letter that gets you into Dartmouth or MIT or Harvard or somewhere, or the big bucks, full ride scholarships. Okay, the next one is Keith Jones. Keith Jones is an imaginary person I pulled off the web. This is a great idea of like what a high school resume should look like, both in formatting, so how it's structured, the use of white space, the, the different fonts, you could probably even make it a little bit bigger on the font, expand it out a little bit. That make it easier to read. If you've never seen a resume, so you, you know what you're looking for then on education, kind of how the experience, and it looks like there's both paid and volunteer under Keith's resume, right? Because this is your inventory. The time is now. Even if it's senior year and you're going in and you're, you're like, oh my gosh, this woman is outlining all this stuff and we do not have it. You do. Just take a deep breath. My BFF wifey always says, the only way you eat an elephant is one bite at a time. Okay, so we've, we've one bite at a time. There's a list here. We've made it easy and it's up front, right? You just gotta take a deep breath and start making your inventory. So if you'll go through, find out where they worked, you know, did they do Sunday school class? You'll be amazed once you start thinking about your inventory, what your student really has done but you need to start getting it on paper and developing it with them because this is going to be their formal presentation in writing. And you're also team, and you're the team lead parents, you're coaching them, getting them prepared to answer those interviews, especially after they learn the behavioral interviewing techniques, right? So then you have the other experience, you've got computer skills, and also then in the inventory, you start realizing where there's holes. What holes do we have and how can then we can start identifying how we fill those holes. Then we're going to go to tips to applying for scholarships. You're going to determine what they want and I know that sounds odd, but there's a lot of people that will give you applications that make no sense. So if you again apply to the nurses to become an RSU nurse, bachelor's degree, do you think they want you to go work in private industry for Buku's money or do they want you to write about how you want to come back to Claremore Indian Hospital and change the world and work for the Indian country? Do you see what I was saying? So when you, there's a thought process before, so I, I haven't, I don't know if it's because I'm a teacher's kid, but I love office supplies. I have a thing about office supplies. Posty notes, the really big ones with the lines. Oh my gosh, that is like heaven. You cannot let me loose. I, I know I'm the, I own my company. I cannot take my company credit card, go to Staples or whatever. It's dangerous. So I take those post-it notes and with post-it notes when I graduated high school, youngins. So if you go through, 
you like take your application, this is what I would do, or you can just cover sheet, but you need to be able to find it. You're gonna be inundated with paper at some point. And I still use paper because sometimes that's how I think. Cause you're gonna wanna like sketch it out before you kind of input it into the computer maybe. So you need to determine what they want. And you can put that on the post-it note, kind of sketch out what this looks like and then give them what they want. And then you want to make, you need to maybe be prepared to add something special and distinct. So in doing that, how do you determine what they want? You need to actually read the application. So the easiest way to do this is you read the application before you're actually working on it. So even if it's months down the line that it's due, then read it now while it's calm and you can actually think and it's not so stressful, especially if it's your senior year, you're not in finals yet, you don't have senioritis, whatever they call it now and all that other stuff. So you need to start sketching out what is what you need. You know, do they require three certified, uh, what is it, the uh, transcripts? Well, I don't know how Jinx, how does Jinx do certified transcripts? Is it, the is it online or is it physically? Okay, so this is an action item. If whatever school you're at, you have to find out how you get a certified transcript. Because I'm gonna bet money, there is a process and a lead time. One school that I talked to had like a six week lead time. Yes, this is serious stuff. You have got, so you need to know what your process is, what your lead times are, because these application preparation comes months before, years before, because you're working up towards it. So one of the things, uh, really quick, the reason why I was excited about Mary being here, because I'm no longer on tribal council, and you need to find your tribal council person, is because cards become an issue. The information from the tribe, your certificates, some scholarships even require a certified Indian letter, right? That comes from the registrar typically of the tribe and it's a whole separate process, whole separate form and whole separate wait time. So why don't you just already go ahead and plan on having that at the first of every year or do one every six months so there's kind of like a new date on it or something like that, right? But you need to know what that lead time is and what that process is. So I used to put a shout when I was on tribal council, the grandma citizenship card, like packets. And I did give that electronically to Amy as well, and she can probably post that. So it's kind of out of date because it's, there's a map of your council people and stuff that don't, that's old. But I would put out who, you know, the list, how to contact them, how to get a hold of them, whatever that is. And that's important. You need to know who, if you're Choctaw, did you know that they have an email list for Choctaw just on education? I'm on it. I'm not Choctaw. It's wonderful, wonderful. They showcase students, they talk about scholarships, internships, and it comes out weekly or monthly, I can't remember. Every tribe has resources, but you need to have a legible, clear, not been washed 50 times or folded, citizenship card, membership card, CDIB card. Do you know that in Cherokee Nation that people were issued CDIB cards without ever becoming citizens? And some scholarships require, including Cherokee Nation money, require citizenship. Do you know if your student actually has citizenship? The white card is not citizenship. That's a certificate of degree of Indian blood. This is painful. These are the details that get you the money though. That's why I'm going through everything. So you need to be making your list, what you're following up with. Um, if you interview, let's say that really that's gonna be the new Gates scholarship and you've got all these full blood straight off the res that are bilingual in their language. And these Cherokee applicants show up. Now they're not gonna get a picture of you. They may see your CDIB, your blood quantum. So, or maybe they come in and interview. Do you think that they're gonna ask you how you're engaged in your tribal government? Are you registered to vote? Do you vote? Do you take your tribal newspaper? Basic civics, right? So they're, in that grandma packet, that's what I call it, because in our community, it used to be the grandmas kind of like organized all of us, right? That was just how it was. So I, I refer to it as my grandma packet. So all those things are there so you can get a replacement blue card, you can get request the Cherokee Phoenix for a nominal amount of money. And every tribe has these things. You just need to find your forms, right? Then, then you have like uh, your, you can register to vote, 
think there's one more thing. And I would go ahead and reach out to your tribal council person, just know who they are. So what if they ask? What if they go to National Congress of American Indians and they know your council person? And you don't. And they ask you that in an interview that's like worth $35,000, $50,000. I hate to not know that answer to that question, right? So just make sure that there's ways to engage and it's not too late. These are last minute things that we can do even as seniors to start kind of identifying as Cherokee Nation citizens or Choctaw or Creek or, or Seminole, whatever those things are. Okay, so you want, you want to make sure, target your application, don't be modest, because all they're gonna get is that paper and we do not want to go in the no pile. We want to go in the yes, give me the money pile, right? That's what we want. Show them that you need it. Um, if you are a gazillionaire's child, but you decided and that it was all oil money, and you decide you wanted to study king penguins in the Antarctic because there actually is global warming, Senator Inhofe, you're wrong, you know, and they disown you because, again, you're going against oil interest or whatever that is, and you really are determined to study king penguins, but on paper, your FAFSA looks like you're a gazillionaire, right? Trust from baby. You need to write a letter that says, I have been disowned because this is what I want to study and explain very clearly and very quickly why the paperwork does not match the need. See what I'm saying? There's other circumstances. Then let's see, um, make sure you, if, oh, nurses. Sometimes now you, you have to know your audience on your applications. So what if they don't ask for references? However, you know, like the nurses, again, they don't know what they're doing on their application. Good people, good intentions. That's not what we're saying. But you happen to be neighbors to one of the key janitors that's worked for 30 years at the Indian Hospital in Claremore. And you, he, he or she broke her leg like one winter and you shovel their sidewalk for them as a, as a young person because it's your neighbor and you love them and you've done other things. They didn't ask for references and you're applying for that scholarship. Don't you think you want to get a letter from their buddy, the janitor that probably takes care of the nurses? I mean, you see what I'm saying? So think about what you might know that are references in terms of that group that's offering the scholarship. Even if they don't ask it, that maybe it's a cover letter from their friend. There's other ways to package things, right? So make sure you tell them why you're special. Spell check. Don't forget, spell check can do bizarre things. Spell check is not always spell check. I've had that happen, or swipe. Um, make sure and double check, again, posting notes. So if there was attachments, you might have a posting note that's just colored just for attachments and it has your list that you check off. Because while you had plenty of time to think about it and read, here it was, but now it's coming up on the deadline and you're in a hurry and you've got other stuff going on, but this keeps you to make sure you don't lose the money because you didn't complete the application. So make it easy on yourself. This is your internal friction process. This is what you own for yourself. Team, don't forget to ask someone to look it over for you um, because it's real easy to put somebody in the no pile rather than in the money pile. So that's what, that's what parents are for. You're the editors. You're the fresh set of eyes to check and make sure everything's in there together before it gets sent off, right? This one last check. That's what parents are great about and help hone those skills for those students. You wanna keep copies of your application. How many of you in the past maybe had Cherokee Nation lose their scholarship paperwork? So then you need to make sure it's return receipt required if it's supposed to be mailed anymore. So that, and then you keep that for two or three bucks. Then you have insurance on everything you did to make sure that, especially if that's kind of guaranteed money, the Cherokee Nation's kind of guaranteed money in other tribal scholarships kind of, that just is insurance to make sure you get that money you need for those for school. Um, make sure and follow up on the phone. How many of you like maybe use a whiteboard for your family or you have those throwaway insurance calendars or maybe you have a big calendar or you have big paper calendars? Whatever your diary or calendar is, it's almost like I, I used to do project management at one point in my life. When you're doing those applications, you got your big post-it notes going on, you might as well write in the due date. 
Then think about, well, hey, you're on it, and you know that this is like a two-week application. It's going to take you two weeks, the 30 minutes you have every day, to chip, chip, chip away at it when you finally get the transcript you need. Because you have to wait, because it has to be fall, so you have to wait till January, and it's due in March, whatever that is. <laughs> so you need to put the due date, then put a date two weeks before that you start working on it. Remind yourself to start working on it. And then the day when you would mail it or email it, right? Just go ahead and build those project management timelines into your own calendar, knowing kind of what your life and your schedule is like. It will pay dividends later because you're gonna, do you think anybody remember the ice storm that shut down Tulsa and Northeastern Oklahoma for like two to weeks to four weeks? Most of our students in Northeastern Oklahoma did not receive the Gates Scholarship. Gates did not care. We didn't meet the deadline. Do you hear what I'm saying? Does not matter. So deadlines are critical. Just like at work or whatever else they're doing, you have to meet the deadline whether we have power on or not. So if you have a hard copy calendar or something that's really telling you what's going on, then you can manage that even if you're in the middle of an ice storm. We literally had students and parents that's like, oh, they'll just let us, everybody knows we're in an ice storm. No, they did not care. When we lost probably more than a million dollars in scholarship funds that year alone because people did not pay attention to the deadline. Those people do not care. They have a deadline. That's They will be sued by other people if they allow you in. And You see what I'm saying? They have to have fairness. Okay. <laughs> While you're, this is another reason to do your early stuff with the posty notes. What if you get on there and you get the nurse's scholarship and you're confused? The application, although well intended, doesn't make sense. Or maybe you want to see if you need to provide more to put you over the edge. So if you call Andrew the day of or the day before it's due, do you think he's really going to be able to answer you? I did this presentation for Osage Nation twice. The second time they did, I did it for them. Literally, these you, the, you could see the look of fear and memory across these, these employees' faces. Every time the Osage Nation scholarship was due, they had like two and 3,000 people calling and they would have to shut down the tribe Indian child welfare workers and other people were having to answer the phone. It would literally jam up the entire phone system, shut down entire departments because people were calling to ask questions the day before and the day it was due. Do you think that gets people money? That doesn't get you the money. You want the money, right? Yeah. So make sure if there's questions, that's another reason to review these applications early. And don't forget, you can always review old applications if they're kind of late and bringing them out to kind of get an idea of what's going to be expected. So you can start aiming for what you need and then kind of look to see if it's been changed. All right. Oh, and the other thing is, one last thing is if you are a Native American female graduating in engineering and they want a 3.75, you are a unicorn. Okay, so this is why this is that part where. So I literally I had I graduated with a three point four eight in my bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. I look back and couldn't figure out why people were throwing money at me. Could not. I mean, literally, I had people hand me scholarships I didn't really even apply for because they were looking for unicorns. Okay, so if you want money, you need to go into STEM, be a female and a Native American or a male. Right? I mean, you, there's, there's money. They want us to do these things. So I look back at National Science Foundation statistics, and these are for self-identifiers. So that means wannabes and fakes have self-identified at some point, too. So you could probably cut off about half these people. But the year I graduated in 1997, there were only 75 females that identified as Native Americans graduating any engineering degree that entire year. So if, if I got an application and they said they wanted a 375, I'd either just go ahead and apply or call them. I'd be like, hey, I've got a 3.48 or whatever that was at the time. You know, you think, and they'd be like, yes, we have not given this out. I need to tell my bosses that we're giving out the money. We'll give you an exception. That's very real. 
So understand your application, understand your audience, understand the intentions of what they want because there is additional money out there and if you're working these applications and working the groups of nurses or whoever that is, there's pots of money. And I fought for 50 bucks. Remember, I'm a teacher's kid. We didn't have extra. I was working a job at Mazio's Pizza. So I knew what it was 325 an hour was. I knew what minimum wage was. So my mom said, look, it's senior year. I know this is difficult, but you need to put some time in. So even if you're making, you know, if you spend two or three hours and you get 500 bucks, let's say, let's say you do two hours and you get a $500 scholarship, which is kind of small today, right? That's still $250. That's better than flipping burgers, right? An hour. That's a lot of money. That's what time well invested. So anytime you can invest in this process, you're putting money towards yourself and investing in your future. So you'll see on the web resources, there's only a couple of things I'll highlight. By the way, Gates Millennium is back and they changed. I failed to update this. I think it's September, isn't it? Or October, Kimberly? Yeah, the due date was September. <laughs> so you need to look at the Gates Millennium. It has come back. It's different and it's moved to September, I think, for the fall. It's changed up completely. So you need to investigate. By the way, that's, a, that's what I call unicorn scholarships. It happens once. You cannot go and enter freshman year of college or, co or sophomore and apply for this. There's one time in your life you can apply for it, and that's your senior year of high school. But it closes in September, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So the next year is senior. Okay. Yeah. So every year now, so they've moved their date. They changed it up for a while. It wasn't being awarded. It, so this, it's back. We didn't know if it'd even come back. I mean, I, I personally wrote Bill Gates and said, would you please bring this back for Indian country? I used my tribal letterhead. I was like, please, you know. So that's back. Don't forget to Google. There's, there's pots of money everywhere. The other things I want to highlight is Voc Rehab. There is still money out there for severe allergies and asthma. And that constantly is a moving target not only because of state budgets, because just state policy changes. But if you have disabilities, there is money for school under Voc Rehab, and people forget about that bucket, and it's a grant. Then Oklahoma State Regents for Higher Education, which also offers the summer academies. So if you're trying to figure out, you've got younger students, and you're trying to figure out how to build a resume. So both my brother and I, both my brother and I went to a, uh, Oklahoma State Regents, that's your taxpayer dollars at work. I, during the summer, we went to, like, I think Britt did archaeology? Paleontology. Paleontology. I did, like, fractals on computers. I did engineering at OU. Uh, I did water quality testing at Ada. By the way, this is a free vacation for all the parents, okay, because the state's paying for it. They may even give you gas money to bring them to and from, drop them off. They hire these teachers that stay with them in the dorm and feed them. Yes, I mean, this is awesome. I, I mean, mom's like, you know, through, we, so we went out to these camps and it was a huge life experience, especially if you're coming from a town like Seminole where 100 people graduate. Now, Jinx, it's a little bit different, but if you go from 100 people in your whole graduating class to freshman physics or chemistry that has three or 400 people at Oklahoma State, that's an eye-opener. So even though my dad was a math teacher at Seminole Junior College and both obviously educators, so we had a hand, a little bit different hand up at home to help in terms of retention at school. This is also not only a resume builder, but it helps retain your student at school because they then understand how to navigate a college campus, start getting comfortable in those buildings. It really helps later as well as build a resume. I cannot talk, I cannot speak enough about these opportunities. And there's other funders, but this is an obvious choice that is out there. And don't forget if you're OLAP eligible, and I think that's still by 10th grade and the state has upped the income, so more people qualify. But again, it's a unicorn thing, it's once in a lifetime. If you have not registered by 10th grade, you're not, you can't register after that. Let's see, virtual resume, there's some other stuff. Um, salary calculator, I'm all about numbers. 
Uh, my brother and I can't function in the world without quantifying it almost. So there's a salary calculator on there. Here's my story because you're gonna have to talk to your students. So I went from, as a professional, well I graduated from Stillwater and moved to Colorado Springs to work for Hewlett Packard. And my mom tried telling me about cost of living. She tried. It didn't work, even as a young professional. You know, there's some things you just have to learn the hard way, right? So uh, it didn't hit home until I love watermelons. And what do we pay like three, four bucks on the side of the road for massive watermelons, even to now, maybe five or six, like inflation. So in uh, 1998, I go to Colorado Springs and I'm like, I'm confused. I don't even remember if I called mom, but they had these, I was single. So I, I didn't need like a full Oklahoma watermelon. There was a family to share it with, but they had these basketball sized watermelons, which I'd never seen before. I didn't remember them at home. And they were selling by the pound. I'm like, how do you calculate that? I mean, like really, those are dense. I mean, that's gonna be outrageous. But then I watched and it dropped. And I'm thinking, okay, I gotta have a watermelon. So I get this basketball sized watermelon up to the counter. There's a line at this big grocery store in Colorado Springs. She rings that up and it was like 13 bucks. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you have got, you, I can't pay, take this back. I didn't care how embarrassing it was, right? That was my cost of living, like wake up, right? The idea that something I loved or something that I needed really did cost that much difference and I needed a plan for that. So when you're setting your numerical goal for how much money you need to raise in terms of scholarships, you need to look at your goal college and the amount of money that you're going for, right? Just what they say, and then if your student's gonna live off campus or around campus or something, use a salary calculator and find out what that cost of living difference is because you need to factor that in too and raise that money in scholarships. Because there's a point, if you, I have gotten thank you notes after this workshop. Um, one of the ones that was awesome because it was numbers and I really remembered it. This young Cherokee woman from over in the Owasso area, she wrote me like six months later and she goes, thank you so much. I've been awarded over $75,000 in scholarships because I put your techniques to use. I mean, this is serious stuff, right? This is like awesome. So at what point, there is also a point, if you're just gonna go to OSU, hmm, 75,000, that's a lot, right? So at what point do you stop? Maybe you need that too, if you're really good at it, kind of get obsessed. So kind of set your numerical goals, find out what you did, and part of it needs to be cost of living. Whatever your watermelon is, make sure you understand what the price is before you go there. So the next step is ACEs. You can, you can, I think it's free or reduced rate right now for National American Indian Science and Engineering Society. So it's like at the most 15, 20, $25 for your student to become a member of ACEs and then they become eligible for scholarships and many of them are as much as $5,000 a year. So, and this is also a resume builder. So especially if you can get like maybe a sixth, seventh, eighth grade student and you start getting an ACEs membership and they can put on their resume to Harvard that they've been an ACEs member since sixth grade for 10 years or whatever that is, you know, at some point. Wow, that, you know, they really are serious about this. They're committed, there's long, you mean, they're not gonna see that on other people's resumes, right? And no, people know what ACEs is. There's a list of Cherokee Nation education resources and this has changed over time, so you'll have to, to look. And if your tribe is different, you can see if there's similar stuff because these are activities, again, that build your resume. These are things that you want. So I try to put the action items and takeaway list on the next page. So just in case you didn't capture it, try to put it again. <laughs> on the FAFSA, so it's important that you attend the GEEKS FAFSA workshop or the online school, uh, FAFSA workshop that PINS is doing, so Kimberly can wave at you. This is going to be who's the expert on FAFSA. She's at the back of the room. Here's the deal. I know that sometimes we do not have the same nuclear family that we started with. So if you think that you have an uncooperative parent that is not going to be forthcoming on taxes, we need to find them all and hunt them down right now for that student. So this is a process. 
You need to resolve that now because you do not want to lose. So if it used to be that on the Gates scholarship was it like the first week of January and that FAFSA had to be completed. So if you have some parent that's not the ex, you know, ex spouse, that's a parent that's being uncooperative as part of that child's FAFSA, and they lose the one time in their life they can do the gates, that's not where I want people. If I need to hunt down a parent with you, you let me know, okay? Because, but let, I want you to anticipate that and deal with it. That's a reality check that we need to do. Plus, just understanding the FAFSA. I don't even go there. I let Kimberly be the expert on that. That is not something I'm gonna do. Uh, I'm glad other people do it. Uh, I talk about this other part. But the FAFSA, even if you're a millionaire, you have to fill it out because a lot of times scholarships want to know, have you completed it? And you have to give them the deal to show that you're not qualified for Pell because they're funding other students. So everyone needs to expect to complete the FAFSA at this point. It's a different day and age. Okay, also you need to make sure that you understand parents, both parents, whoever's contributing to the FAFSA towards the bottom, S Corp versus C Corp kind of stuff. Like if, you're, if your tax accountant suddenly changes your tax status, you could literally get a student out of school. We, uh, we had a Cherokee student that lost an Ivy League school opportunity because unknowingly a parent changed the type of corporation on their small business and it disqualified them from the program they were on and they had to leave. Ivy League and come home and I'll never forget that so I've added that I want you to think about it these every detail is a serious detail that I've tried to put on paper to pass on to give you a chance at getting the money because again we want a nice nursing home don't we we don't we don't want the couch we don't want the extra room we want the nice nursing home I'm just joking but you know what I'm talking about so there, there's also, you can sign up for my ongoing professional chapter of ACES listserv where I push out scholarships and such. Uh, and I try to make that about careers around STEM for scholarships, internships, uh, and full-time jobs. And it gives you a flavor and I try to make it subject specific where it's easy to delete. I'm doing that as a volunteer so you will see no activity and then you'll see a lot of activity. But again, I try to make it easy to delete and I try to keep it pushed out so you can meet deadlines. So if I have any time at all, I try to keep it moving and you'll see stuff periodically. Next, there's like high school students quick guide to becoming an engineer. And if you wanna convince them why they need to be engineers, besides the fact that all of us need to hire them, you can look, this was uh, from 2015-2016. Those are starting salaries and mid-level career salaries by engineering type. So if you wanna tempt people in and money's how you tempt them, that's how we start talking about getting to math and science literacy and being able to speak to people and read and write. We need people that are functionally literate in math, science, and reading to fill these jobs. And we will pay you to go to school to do that and then we pay you well in life in your career. Andrew knows that, he's an engineer too, so yeah. So I, I think there was one somewhere in there and I missed it, there was a taxability of scholarships. That's straight off the IRS webpage, it hasn't been updated in a while. You need to understand parents, it may impact your household income, so make sure you're talking to your students. So if they're the ones going, Hey, Kara, six months from now, I got $75,000 worth, and I'll be like, yes, that's awesome. We're doing great. So if they're that successful, they will be impacting at some point because the extra dollars, if those are written back from that bursar, I think, I think all colleges call them bursar offices. So the, the financial office, any excess money will be written back to pay for room and board, could be taxable. So you have to make sure you understand what's taxable, what isn't, if they have to keep receipts to make sure it doesn't impact your household tax, taxable income and those things. So I have left you with a lot to think about. I think we have about 25 minutes. I'm happy to answer questions from the floor or we can just visit one-on-one. -on -one. Does anyone have any burning questions? <laughs>